Hello, I'm Father Kenneth Metz, a priest of All Souls Catholic Church in Sanford, Florida. How does the church celebrate a feast of great joy in the midst of recalling the suffering and death of Jesus? Quietly, in a very subdued manner. That is, until the 13th century. Let me explain what happened. The institution of the Eucharist is celebrated on Holy Thursday at the beginning of the sacred triduum, those three days when we commemorate the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The emotions of Holy Thursday are hardly those of great joy and celebration as we contemplate the sufferings of Jesus. The solemnity of the body and blood of Christ, in Latin, Corpus Christi, is the time when we can celebrate with great joy the gift we receive in the Holy Eucharist. This feast is celebrated on the Sunday after Trinity Sunday. How this feast came to be 1,200 years after the institution of the Holy Eucharist is fascinating. It took holy people, popes, famous theologians, and the people of God to bring this feast about. The story begins in Belgium, where St. Juliana of Liege was the prioress, in, a mystic, in the monastery of Mount Comillian near Liege. In her prayer, she often saw a strange image, a full moon with a small dark spot in the middle. Frustrated by this image that came again and again, she asked the Lord what this could mean. And he answered her in prayer, in a vision, showing her what it meant. The bright moon was the liturgical year. The dark spot was the lack of a festival in honor of the Blessed Sacrament. And she was told by Jesus to ask church leaders to establish such a feast. Well, it took a while before she did that. She was afraid to bring it up. In 1230, Juliana confided her message to church leaders, but they did not listen. Sixteen years later, the Bishop of Lige did listen, and the diocesan synod voted to have such a feast in their city. One of the archdeacons of their city eventually became pope, and he took the name of Urban IV. Six years after Sister St. Juliana's death in 1258, Pope Urban de decreed that this celebration should take place on the Thursday after Pentecost. However, he died soon after he issued the decree, and the decree was never really implemented. But finally, in 1314, Pope Clement V instituted the feast for the entire church. However, that applied to the Western Church, not the Eastern Church. In the Eastern part of the Church, many of them have since then instituted the feast. Well, Pope Urban IV commissioned a Dominican theologian by the name of Thomas Aquinas to write the prayers for the Mass and the Divine Office. He wrote these, and they are some of the most beautiful prayers that ever could have happened. He enriched the liturgy of the church tremendously. And to this day, we still sing the hymns and say the prayers he wrote, centering on the Eucharist. For example, the Tantumergo we sing at benediction was written by Thomas Aquinas. Well, Corpus Christi is listed as one of the holy days of obligation in the church. That law is to be celebrated, it says, on Thursday following Trinity Sunday. And where it is not a holy day of obligation, such as here in the United States, the celebration is moved to Sunday after Trinity Sunday. What role did the Eucharistic miracle of Balsina play 
in this history. If you have ever traveled to Italy, north of Rome, you would have been undoubtedly shown this beautiful church in Ovieto. And they would have told you the story about the beginning of the celebration of Corpus Christi. And this is the way they would tell the story. In 1263, a priest from Germany, Father Peter of Prague, was making a pilgrimage to Rome. And he stopped in Balsina, Italy, which is not too far away from Orvieto, to celebrate Mass at the Church of St. Christina. Now at that time, he was beginning to doubt about Jesus being truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. He was affected by a lot of discussions among theologians going on at that time who were challenging the belief that the body and blood of Christ were actually present in the consecrated bread and wine. And what happened to him was that while he was celebrating Mass at the time of the consecration prayer, as he held the host in his hand, drops of blood came from that host and dripped on the altar and the corporal. And the corporal is the white cloth that is always in the center of the altar when the priest celebrates Mass. Well, astounded by this, the story goes that St. Peter then reported this to Pope Urban IV, whom we heard about before, who was at that time in the town of Orvieto, at the cathedral there. And the Pope sent delegates to investigate and to determine what happened at that time. And he ordered that the host and the blood-stained corporal be brought to Orvieto. The relics were then placed in the cathedral of Orvieto, where they are today. And this church is famous for its frescoes and mosaics depicting the event. What are we to believe about the miracle of Balsena? Well, to begin with, it's really important for us to realize that any miracle, such as this one, is a private revelation in which the church does not demand we believe. However, we may believe it in good conscience. Then we need to look around at the historical facts surrounding the accounts and any other explanations for what may have occurred at that time. In this case, we find no reference at all to that miracle in the account of the life of Pope Innocent or Pope Urban IV or in the canonization documents of St. Thomas Aquinas. The first mention we hear about this miracle does not appear until years after the establishment of the feast of Corpus Christi. And lastly, in one study of the corporal, the blood stain apparently could have been part of a culture of the bacterium Seretia incessansas. Similar red markings were found in wheat bread used by Alexander the Great in his army. It was found also in polenta in Italy and in potatoes, of all things, in Germany. For these reasons, the events of Balsina are usually not included in the histories of the feast, except in Balsina and Orvieto, where the stained corporal is taken in procession on the feast of Corpus Christi. A procession, though. And to emphasize the importance of the feast and the solemnity of the feast, processions with the Blessed Sacrament outside the church are recommended for this holy day. And during the processions, oftentimes they'll have four stops or four stations in each part of the direction of the compass, northeast, south, and west. And at each station, hymns would be sung, a gospel would be read, and prayers would be said. In some places, these processions are very elaborate as they wind their procession through the streets of a village or town. 
The feast of the body and blood of Jesus gives us the opportunity to give thanks for the great joy, with great joy, for the gift of the Holy Eucharist. Thank you for watching. Remember to visit us on our website at allsoulssanford.org, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, may the Lord in the Eucharist continue to bless you.